True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. Two children disappear and a man is brought in for questioning. He was the last one seen with both of them. His wild hair bushy beard and distinctive Wellington boots mean that locals in P.E. know him well. They call him Butty Boor, and it's not necessarily an affectionate name, but it has never instilled the level of fear that it will after he sits across the table from a policeman and says two words, I'm sick. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 45, The Crimes of Stuart Wilkin. Before I get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our newest Patreon supporters for the week. A huge thank you goes out to Azzy and Peter Peterser for signing up to support the show on Patreon. I'd also like to thank Michelle Whitehead for her donation. Thank you so much, everyone. Your support is greatly appreciated. If you'd like to support the show through Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave the links in the show notes. As always, any form of support is greatly appreciated, and it doesn't have to be financial. Sharing of episodes, inviting your friends and family to listen, and interacting on social media are all great ways to keep the show growing and improving. The case I'm covering today is pretty well known and has been covered on quite a few platforms. I think the reason for this is because it's very simply a really strange and shocking case. This is a serial killer case, but it holds none of the usual elements of a serial crime or investigation. There was no hunt for an elusive killer using profiling or specific serial investigation techniques. There was no lingering sense of dread in the community as they watched their neighbours being cut down by an invisible, murderous phantom. In fact, no one even knew that this man was active until he was arrested and admitted to having killed others. This isn't a case of poor police investigation. It's simply a testament to the fact that this man followed almost none of the usual patterns we expect from serial killers, and that is, perhaps, what has made his crimes all the more terrifying. In researching this case, I used several different sources, including Mickey Pistorius's book, Strangers in the Street, two episodes of the show Orpsia Suspur, several media articles, a philosophy study based around the court transcripts of the case, as well as an academic article I found online by Martin Strom. So let's get into episode 45, The Crimes of Stuart Wilkin. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Stuart Wilkin was not born with that name. In fact, we have no idea what his birth name was. His date of birth would eventually be determined as being the 11th of November 1966, but he only spent the first six months of his life with his biological parents. In 1967, six-month-old Stuart was found with his toddler sister, abandoned in a telephone booth in Boxburg. The domestic worker that found him would play an enormous role in his life and in the lives of many others in the future, although she would have no idea that by taking those two abandoned children home to her employer, her decision would have such seemingly wide-reaching consequences. 
The woman's employer, a man who we and Stuart would only ever know as Dup, decided to keep the children. The boy would spend the first two years of his life living with and being horrifically abused by Dup. During this time, he says that his sister disappeared, he had no idea where she'd gone to, and so little Stuart was left to fend for himself with this stranger who'd become his father figure overnight. When I read about the abuse that Stuart claimed to suffer during the first two years of his life, I will admit to being a bit sceptical. Firstly, it's pretty uncommon to have such vivid memories of the first two years of your life. And secondly, the claims would be made in a scenario where Stuart needed people to feel sorry for him. I did, however, read that the woman who would eventually legally adopt him had confirmed the abuse that he'd suffered. I'm going to give a warning here that what I'm about to describe is beyond horrific. Stuart says that Dup would burn his genitals with cigarettes. He would chain the child alongside the dogs and force him to eat food from the dogs' bowls. He says that Dup forced him to watch him committing acts of bestiality with the dogs. And then, when he was finished, he was made to clean Dup's penis with his mouth. The boy was infested with lice and severely malnourished when Dup's neighbours, the Wilkins, took pity on the child and brought him to live with them. The Wilkins wanted to legally adopt Stuart, but to do so they had to get his biological mother's consent. Stuart would later say that he'd recalled a woman coming to the Wilkins' house one day and bringing him a packet of sweets. He says that he'd rejected the sweets and refused to interact with the woman. He'd later discover that this was his biological mother. She signed him over to the Wilkins that day and then disappeared from his life again. Almost from day one, Stuart was understandably an extremely difficult child, Mrs. Wilkin would report. Not only was his behaviour continuously inappropriate, but he was aggressive and would lash out, biting people and striking them for no reason. From an academic perspective, Stuart also struggled significantly, having not had the best start in life. He failed grade one, and Mrs. Wilkin, likely not understanding how deeply seated his issues were, thought that he was simply not trying hard enough. She withheld the boy's Christmas present as punishment. Stuart was enraged and vowed that from that day he would make absolutely no effort in school. When he eventually made it to grade three, Stuart failed the year three times and was sent to a special needs class. There he claims the teacher bullied him and enticed the other children in the class to tease him about being adopted. He says that he'd had no idea that he was adopted, and found out from his classmates. Again, Stuart turned his pain into rage, and assaulted the teacher. As punishment, he was beaten by the principal in front of the other children, and then a classmate was encouraged to assault him. When he retaliated, he says that he was sent home, where he was further punished by Mrs. Wilkin. As if the child's development had not endured enough stunting, Stuart says that he started smoking dacha regularly at the age of eight. He says that he wet the bed almost every night and was punished for it. At the age of nine, Stuart says that he was sodomized by a church deacon. Whether he shared this trauma with anyone is unknown, but it would seemingly play an enormous role in his future acts. Mrs. Wilkin had no idea how to deal with Stuart, and eventually contacted the Department of Welfare for assistance. 
The boy was sent to an industrial reform school, where he says the trauma continued as he was raped by the older boys at the school. He would eventually run away from the school and went to live with his adopted aunt. The woman allowed him to stay with her for a month and then told him he needed to go back to his adopted parents, who by that time had moved to Port Elizabeth. She gave him bus fare and food and sent him on his way. As he was technically on the run from the state-mandated placement in the reform school, when he arrived in P.E., Stewart had to appear in front of a magistrate. The court determined that as long as Stewart agreed to finish grade 11, he no longer needed to stay in the reform school. The boy agreed and managed to pass the grade. That was the end of school for Stewart, though. The following year, he joined the army. After four months and a suicide attempt, the young man was discharged and sent home. Stuart moved back in with the Wilkins and took up an apprenticeship as a joiner. He injured his hand, however, and started to receive disability pension. Stuart Wilkin would meet the woman who would become his first wife, Lynn, at a nightclub in 1984 when he was 18. Lynn already had a daughter from a previous relationship when they moved in together, and the following year, on Christmas Day, 1985, she gave birth to Stuart's daughter, who they called Wane. Lynn claims that after Wane was born, Stuart no longer wanted to have vaginal sex with her. He only wanted to have anal sex. Stuart, on the other hand, claimed that Lynn had started working as a sex worker and that she would often leave him and the children alone at night to work. Whether or not this is true, life in the home was clearly not stable, as the Department of Welfare threatened to remove Lynn's older daughter from the home. For some reason, the department felt that if the couple were married, they would somehow provide a more stable home. And so Stuart and Lynn, a couple who were clearly poorly suited as it was, decided to get married when Wane was five years old, so that Lynn's older daughter wouldn't be removed. The marriage, however, remained marred by violence and Lynn regularly called the police on Stuart for using Dacha. He was eventually admitted to Elizabeth Duncan Psychiatric Hospital. Interestingly, here, he was apparently diagnosed with psychopathy. Today, of course, that diagnosis would likely not be made, and it would fall under a spectrum of personality disorders. But he would be referred to as a diagnosed psychopath, throughout his eventual trial as well, so he must have scored pretty high on the psychopathy checklist. Of course, neither psychopathy nor any personality disorder on the spectrum is treatable by medication, so Stewart's stay in the psychiatric hospital was brief. People with personality disorders can, of course, be helped to live fruitful and happy lives, through psychotherapy and being taught coping mechanisms, but this clearly did not happen for Stuart. His disorder aside, he definitely needed to be in regular therapy for his childhood traumas, but that didn't happen either. If it had, and Stuart had allowed himself to be treated by experts, rather than self-medicating with drugs and violence, His story may have had a very different ending, as with the stories of some of his victims. On release from psychiatric care, Stuart tried to return home to Lynn, but she called the police. When he saw the police van pulling into the driveway, Stuart took an overdose of tablets. His attempt at suicide was thwarted, though, and by the time he was discharged from hospital after his overdose... Lynn had filed for divorce, which would go uncontested. Lynn remarried soon after divorcing Stuart. In 
Wane lived with her, and Stuart would visit the child occasionally. They allegedly had a good father-daughter relationship, but his visits would often be marred by violent altercations with Lynn's new husband, and he would often visit with the girl on the pavement outside the house. Despite being on disability pension, Stuart found work as a fisherman. He enjoyed the work, but as had become normal for him, his difficult personality, short temper and violent outbursts soon had him thrown off the trawler. This job, though, would instill in Stuart a deep love of the sea, and this too would play into his future crimes. The story is usually told in two parts. Most will tell Stuart's story first, and then only reveal the details of the crimes he committed at the end. I personally think that it makes much more sense to tell the story as it happened. So let's rewind ever so slightly, now that you know more about Stuart Wilkin. Because there's something you don't know about him yet. At this point in his life, as Wilkin is recovering from his suicide attempt and divorcing his first wife, he has already killed five people. Although to this day it is believed that there are unconfirmed victims of Stuart Wilkin, his first confirmed murder occurred in February 1990. This would have coincided with him marrying Lynn when Wane was five years old and it's likely that the stress of the Department of Welfare trying to remove the older daughter triggered this murder. Wilkins' first victim was a homeless child called Monty Fico. The boy was just 15 years old when he was sodomized and strangled to death by Wilkin at Celia's Secondary School in Sydenham, P.E. The child's murder would remain unsolved for seven years. Just a few months later, on the 3rd of October 1990, Wilkins switched his victim profile and targeted a sex worker. He met Virginia Heisman in Russell Road, Port Elizabeth. They agreed on 50 rand for a sexual transaction and went to a nearby school to carry out the act. When there... Wilkin had vaginal sex with the woman and then attempted to force her to have anal sex. When she refused, he strangled her with her own clothing. It was during this murder that Wilkin's strangulation fantasy would be cemented. He would later describe strangling his victims while he faced them and during the sex act. He says that the victim's lips began to swell and their tongue protruded. Only then was he able to reach orgasm. Virginia's body was left in the school ground. No one linked the murder of Monte Fico to that of Virginia, though, because they were totally different profiles. Wilkins' next murder occurred three months later, in January 1991, when he again killed a sex worker, Mersha Parpenfuss, was soliciting clients at the Red Lion Hotel when she met Stuart Wilkin. They went to St. George's Park, and when she told him that she wanted money up front before having sex with him, Stuart says he snapped and killed her. He claims that he is of the belief that sex is a natural act which should be freely available to all, and that no woman or man should be allowed to charge for it or refuse it. Stuart started a new act with this victim. As he had strangled her before having sex with her, he decided to have sex with her after she was deceased. This triggered a new desire within him, necrophilia. From this point on, Stuart would attempt to hide his victims better, he would also insert newspaper into their orifices to prevent them becoming infested with insects, and then he would return to the bodies, commit necrophilia, and relive his kill each time. 
Wilkins' last two kills before we get to the point that we're at in his story were street children. Sadly, a 14-year-old child victim would never be identified. He was sodomized and strangled, and Wilkin had a lot of time to revisit the body, as it would only be discovered two years later. He then took another 14-year-old boy to the Fort Frederick Museum, where he raped the child. The boy threatened to go to the police, and Stewart strangled him to death, hiding his body in a bush. It is at this point that Stewart has divorced Lynn, and I think it's also important to point out that he's spent several months in a psychiatric facility. We don't know the timing of that for sure, but he had most definitely already killed several people. Despite being assessed by psychiatrists, no one figured out that they weren't just dealing with a man whose life had spiralled out of control due to drug use or who was violent and suffered from a personality disorder. They were treating a serial killer. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not bashing the professionals that treated him. They are psychiatrists, not psychics. But it just goes to show how good people like Stuart are at hiding the truth. If a team of highly trained experts couldn't figure it out, the rest of us were just sitting ducks. There is a significant gap in Stuart Wilkins' crimes after this, and it could be down to one of two things. Either he was killing and he just didn't admit to those crimes for some reason, or he was caught up in a new life that he was building for himself. Wilkin met and married a woman named Veronica, who had two young boys from a previous relationship. Strangely, he would later say that he decided not to have sex or get into relationships with women of his own race at this point, because he was concerned that he was accidentally going to end up sleeping with his sister. This is something we've seen with other serial killers too. They commit some of the most horrendous acts, but they have strict codes around certain things. His sister, of course, had disappeared during his childhood, and he had no idea at that point where she was. So he figured that it was too risky to have relations with any white woman, just in case he stumbled into incest. Wilkins' second marriage, considering he had done nothing to curb his violent tendencies, was no more successful than his first, and Veronica's family hated him from the moment they laid eyes on him, which caused immense strain in the relationship. At one point, he, Veronica, and her two boys moved in with Lynn and her family. This strange arrangement didn't last very long, as one could well imagine, and it's likely around this time that Stuart went back to killing. On the 27th of July 1995, Wilkin picked up Georgina Zweni and took her to a nearby park. Their agreement to have sex for 30 rand soon went out the window, and instead he sodomized and strangled her. He then took his abuse a little further, and I'll warn you that the next details are difficult to listen to. Wilkin would later say that even after raping and killing Georgina, he'd still felt aroused. He was unable to obtain an erection again, though, so instead he inserted a knife into the victim's vagina and cut her open. This, to him, was an act of sexual release. The use of the knife seemed to trigger something else in Stuart, and he also sliced off the woman's nipples and cannibalised them. It would later emerge that Wilkin had been watching police as they'd retrieved each of his victims over the years. He'd watched as forensic teams searched the bodies for evidence before moving them and realised that he was likely leaving behind evidence on the victim's clothing. 
From that point on, he removed his victim's clothing and disposed of them elsewhere. Now this is a man that failed grade three, three times. He's been described as having a fairly low IQ. But as one policeman would later say, Stuart Wilkin was streetwise. He may not have excelled academically, but he was perfectly capable of learning what he wanted to. And unfortunately, he chose to learn how to become an untraceable killing machine. The murder of Georgina Zweni appears to be a watershed moment for Stuart Wilkin, as just two months after he killed her, he would commit what most people consider to be his most horrific crime, at least from a moral perspective. By this time, Stuart was only spending a small amount of time with his wife. He often took off to live in the felt for months at a time. He chose a very specific place to live, a field behind a place called Happy Valley. Happy Valley is a playground and park of sorts, filled with fairy figurines. It's a magical place, and Stuart had visited there with his family when he was younger, and had happy memories there. The field he chose to live in also had a view of the sea, which he loved, and was dotted with several large palm trees. The palm fronds would end up making great coverings to hide his future victims. On the 29th of September 1995, Stuart visited his daughter, Wane. Her older half-sister would say that she last saw the girl sitting on the pavement outside their house, talking to her father. Wane Wilkin, just ten years old at the time, was never seen alive again. Stuart would later relay that he decided to take Wane to Happy Valley that day. He wanted her to experience the magical place he had as a child. He then took her to his makeshift home in the felt nearby, and he says that the girl told him that her stepfather was molesting her. Stuart described performing an examination on Wane to see whether she was still a virgin. When he claims he determined that she was not a virgin, in the hopes of saving her from the life that he had lived, he says that he decided to send her to heaven instead. He strangled his ten-year-old daughter in the felt and kept her body. He would sleep next to the body for months, until it was skeletonized. Then he hid the skeleton, and shaped her clothing into a body of sorts, and slept next to that. He denies that he ever raped his daughter, and the condition in which her body was found meant that there was no way to tell. Stuart's later actions would tell a very different story than he did about this crime, and the experts, including Mickey Pistorius, were certainly not convinced by his claims either. One A. Wilkin was reported missing, and her disappearance was investigated, though. Stuart was questioned, and he claimed that he had left One A sitting on the pavement outside her house. He had no idea where she was, he said. He appears to have gone dormant for a few months after this, until on the 25th of May 1996, he arranged a sexual transaction with Katrina Clarsen. He strangled her, raped her, and shoved a plastic bag down her throat. He dumped her body next to a wall bearing a graffiti message that said, People shouldn't steal. Wilkin found this amusing, because in his opinion, sex workers were stealing money when they made people pay for sex. Between May and August 1996, Wilkin took another street child, who would sadly also remain unidentified. The child was strangled and sodomized and dumped at the same school where he killed his first victim, 
Wilkin, it appeared, was coming full circle. At this time, Stuart was still married to Veronica, and occasionally lived with her and her two boys, in between his stints in the felt. That was until the boys started to make allegations against him. In early 1997, Veronica took her boys to the police station, and charges of sodomy were laid against her husband. He had allegedly been sexually abusing and raping the boys. Now I use the word rape, because not only in my mind is it definitely rape, but today, in 2020, sodomy is included in our definition of rape. But in 1997, sodomy was a separate and essentially lesser charge than rape. At that time, rape only included penile penetration of a vagina, and it took a case in 2007 in which a 10-year-old girl was anally raped by a man for the law to change and the definition of rape to be expanded to include any forceful sexual penetration. Honestly, it's a bit sad that it took us so long to properly protect the rights of men from sexual assault as well. But thankfully, it's eventually happened. After hearing that he had been charged with sexually assaulting the boys, Stuart fled Veronica's home, never returning. He lived in the field with his daughter's corpse and would venture into town during the day. He was known for wearing the same dirty shirt jeans and wellington boots every day. His wild hair and bushy beard had the locals nickname him Butibur, the rough translation of which is Brother Farmer. People mistake this for Stuart's moniker, and some have even said that he adopted it as his alter personality. As a serial killer, Stuart didn't have a moniker, because those are usually formed during an investigation, and often by the press, to make the invisible phantom even more frightening. With Stuart's crimes, though, there was no investigation. No one had any inkling that there was a serial killer on the loose, so he didn't get a moniker. He just got a nickname by locals, who were essentially making fun of him, they likely wouldn't have done if they'd had any clue who he really was. On the 22nd of January 1997, under the strain of the sodomy charges, Wilkin cracked for what would be the final time. Twelve-year-old Henry Bakers was walking from his grandmother's home to his parents' home after having visited with her for the day. A young boy that was friends with Henry would be the key to putting a serial killer behind bars and saving countless small victims when he, quite by chance, spotted the young boy being approached by the man he knew as Butibur. When he saw the pair walk past the street that Henry should have gone down to head home, his instincts kicked in and he ran after them. He asked Henry where he was going, and Stuart Wilkin told the child to mind his own business. Taken aback by the man's sudden aggression, the boy watched Henry disappear down the road, his tiny frame dwarfed by the tall, wild-haired man beside him. It would be the last time he would see his young friend. Stuart Wilkin claims that Henry went with him willingly that day. The boy, he said, asked him to teach him about sex, and so he'd taken him to his Happy Valley felt and told him to undress. He said that he'd masturbated the boy and then forced him to perform oral sex on him. he then started to sodomize him, and the boy had screamed, so he'd strangled him. Henry Bakers knew Stuart Wilkin. The man had lived at the boy's house for a few days. When his mother became concerned that Henry had not returned home, though, 
Booty Bouge was the last person on her mind. Initially, Ellen Bakers assumed that her son had stayed over with his grandmother, which he often did, although it would have made no difference to Henry's eventual fate, as he was already dead by the Wednesday evening on which he went missing. Ellen, unfortunately, waited until Friday to check with the child's grandmother. It was then that she discovered the boy had in fact been missing for two days. The Child Protection Unit was contacted and they began to investigate the boy's disappearance. The same officers from the CPU had also been involved in the investigation of the disappearance of 1A Wilkin and the sodomy charges against Stuart Wilkin. When Henry's young friend came forward to report his sighting and interaction with Wilkin, it seemed like everything was falling into place. On the 28th of January 1997, the CPU officers arrested Stuart Wilkin in connection with the disappearance of Henry Baker's. Stuart appeared horrified that the young boy was missing and told the officers he would do whatever he could to help find him. He admitted that he had indeed walked with Henry that Wednesday afternoon, but they had gone separate ways and he had no idea where the boy was now. He even gave police an alibi for that night, and he was released, as at that point, the boy's sighting was the only evidence they had against him. When the officers checked out that alibi, though, and found it to be false, he was rearrested on the 31st of January 1997. The CPU officers started working with a renowned detective on the PE murder and robbery squad, Sergeant Derek Nosworthy, and he was asked to interview Wilkin about Henry Baker's disappearance, as well as the disappearance of Wene Wilkin. Sergeant Nosworthy had been trained in serial investigations, and when he reviewed Wilkins' history, he started to get a sneaking suspicion that there was more to the man than met the eye. As a tactic, he seated Wilkin in his office, making sure that he had full view of all of his serial investigation training qualifications on the wall, as well as a photograph of his own daughter, who was around the same age as Wane had been when she disappeared. Then he left the room. After a while, he returned to find Wilkin staring at his daughter's photo. Nosworthy sat across from the dishevelled man and told him that he knew that he had killed both Wane and Henry. Wilkin hesitated for a moment and then stretched his hands out in surrender. I'm sick, he admitted. Wilkin then went on to admit killing Wane and Henry. He told Nosworthy that he'd been back to Henry's body that very morning to commit necrophilia. He agreed to show them where the remains of the children were. After the pointing out, Nosworthy took Wilkin back to his office. He knew that there had to be more than those two. When he asked the man how many others there were, he admitted that he had killed at least ten. In a total turnabout on what a so-called normal serial killer investigation would entail, police now had to go back and find the dockets that matched the particulars that Wilkin could remember about his previous crimes. They were able to match nine dockets and bodies to those particulars. Of those crimes, they only had evidence that he had committed eight so Stuart Wilkin was charged with a total of ten murders. Mickey Pistorius was brought in to interview Wilkin, and she describes him as a contradiction. She knew, of course, what he'd done, but he presented himself as a rather gentle and quiet man. What she did pick up was his extreme impulsiveness, 
and the fact that he was highly sexually connected to his crimes. So much so that at one point during her interview with him, he excused himself to masturbate in the toilet. This is something that Pistorius saw with Moses Sotoli three years before as well, although he didn't have the good grace to excuse himself. He simply did it right in front of her. As far as the murder of his daughter is concerned, Pistorius doesn't entirely buy into Stuart's story. She points to his impulsivity as the reason, as well as his intense sexual urges. She explains that even if he was with his daughter, if a sexual urge struck, he doesn't have the part of his brain that tells him that his daughter is not fair game when it comes to his urges. Or as Pistorius puts it, he knows it's wrong, he just doesn't care. He doesn't have the inhibition that other people may have that stops him from carrying out acts that are wrong. He sees what he wants, and he takes it. And that is precisely what makes people like Stuart Wilkin so dangerous. Another reason that it's unlikely that Wilkin's story about Wanae's murder is true is something that the prosecutor mentioned in the program Opsius Espoir. He said that Wilkin was completely calm and unperturbed throughout the trial. One of the only times he showed any discomfort was when the state brought Wanae's skull into the courtroom as evidence. Wilkin asked for the court to be adjourned, and when he was taken down to the holding cell for a break, no, he didn't burst into uncontrollable sobs. Stuart Wilkin had asked for an adjournment because he needed to masturbate after seeing his daughter's skull. The only other time he showed any emotion during his trial was when, on the 23rd of February 1998, he was found guilty of seven of the murders and sentenced to seven life sentences. Upon hearing his fate, he burst into tears. Judge Chris Janssen, on sentencing him, acknowledged that Wilkin had experienced horrific trauma in his childhood, but he also raised suspicion that perhaps not everything that he had told the court was true. He understood that the years of abuse with Dup could be verified to an extent, but he found it difficult to believe that every single person that Stuart had come into contact with had abused him. He also said that if he still had the death sentence available to him as an option, he would have undoubtedly sentenced Wilkin to death. Stuart Wilkin is currently serving seven life sentences in St Albans Prison in Port Elizabeth and says that he suffers from nightmares and that the ghosts of his victims haunt him in prison. During the investigation, Sergeant Nosworthy was able to locate Stuart's biological mother. After he was sentenced and imprisoned, he arranged a telephone call between the two. Nosworthy listened in, hoping to gain some insights into the man through the call. He said that listening to the call was like hearing a conversion from a grown man into a child. Stuart sobbed on the phone and called the woman Mommy, the first time he'd ever used the word in his life. His mother claimed that Stuart's biological father had forced her to abandon her children because she'd become pregnant again. She also solved another mystery for Stuart by telling him that she had come to reclaim his sister and that the woman was alive and well. Whether that was any solace, I don't know, because it would have given him the knowledge that his mother had come back for his sister, but had chosen to leave him behind once again. In 2005, an author requested the opportunity to interview Stuart Wilkin for a book she was writing about his crimes. 
Rihanna Mouton was given permission to interview Wilkin on his agreement, and also on the condition that she did not present the book as a biography, and of course that he did not benefit from it in any way. Rihanna was not allowed to sit in the same room with him. For three days they sat in cubicles side by side, Stuart in his with three policemen and a specialist psychologist, and Rihanna in hers, feeding her questions to the psychologist, who then put them to Stuart. The book was published in Afrikaans under the name Riek van die Duert, and in English under the name The Smell of Death. Also in 2005, Stuart's ex-wife, Lynn, was murdered in Port Elizabeth. The woman had allegedly been walking to a public phone to speak with her current husband, Hermanus Harvenka, who lived in another area, when three men pulled up beside her, pulled her into the car, and sped off, leaving her child standing on the side of the road. Her body was found the next day. She'd been beaten with a blunt object, and mutilated beyond recognition. Stuart Wilkin is one of the most bizarre serial killers I have ever heard of. Sergeant Nosworthy says that, to his knowledge, he's the only serial killer in the world that murdered his own child. He is certainly different to what we've become accustomed to in serial killers in many ways. Although his method of killing, strangulation, was always the same, his choice of victim was varied. He killed young children, some street children, some not, and he killed adult female sex workers of all different races. Pistorius believes that this difference in choice of victim speaks to the two different traumas he was attempting to overcome through his actions. On the one hand, he had been abused as a child, sodomized, he alleges, by several people. This, Pistorius believes, is the reason he chose the children. He was reenacting his own trauma, but this time as the aggressor to take back control. Wilkin himself seemed to have some sort of insight into this when he said that he'd killed children so that they did not have to suffer as he did. This may be a bit more lofty in its ideal than the reality, but he seems to acknowledge, at least in part, that those specific crimes were somehow linked to the sexual abuse he suffered. He also acknowledged that when he was killing the children, he was thinking about the church deacon that had raped him when he was a child. The other victims, the adult females, Pistorius believes, were a representation of the abandonments he'd suffered by his mother. It's important to remember that psychology entertains many different schools of thought. Pistorius's theories are based on the Freudian school of thought, which in part believes that our formative years are divided into different phases and depending on the phase in which a person may experience trauma, they will fixate in that phase. The zero to two-year-old phase, for instance, is called the oral phase, and abandonment or abuse in that phase, in offenders, will result in an oral fixation. This, she says, explains Wilkins' mutilating of his one victim's breasts and consuming them. The Freudian school of thought also places significant emphasis on the mother's role in a child's life, which is, of course, undeniably important. When Wilkin was killing women, he was taking revenge on his mother, Pistorius says. It wasn't that he hated women as such. He hated what they had come to represent to him through his mother. Pistorius's explanations of the behaviour certainly make sense, but even she says that they are merely explanations and never excuses. That is because there are millions of young men 
that have traumatic childhoods and difficult relationships with their mother, but they don't all become serial killers. Stuart Wilkin has been the subject of endless psychological analysis, and although many explanations exist, it still doesn't really tell us why he ended up the way he did. Pistorius weighs in on the importance of abuse in the development of a serial killer and says that of all the serial killers she has interviewed, they had one thing in common. They all said that the worst thing that had ever happened to them in their lives was their parents telling them that they were worthless. Not sexual or physical abuse, but being devalued by those that had given them life. Whenever I cover serial killer cases and I discuss the often difficult and abusive childhoods of the perpetrators, many listeners report feeling torn by their disgust for the person's acts and empathy for the horrific childhoods they had. I'll admit that I've often felt the same way. I've come to realise, though, that it's okay to feel empathy for two-year-old Stuart and nine-year-old Stuart, because then he was a victim too. That empathy does not have to take away from the fact that we are disgusted, angered and repulsed by the person that two-year-old Stuart grew into, because in that he had a choice. In the program Opsia Sespoor, the prosecutor in this case said something that really hit home. He said that he finds it so ironic that we have had to put Stuart Wilkin away for the rest of his life to protect society. This is ironic, he says, because at the end of the day, Stuart Wilkin is a product of society. We made him and then we locked him away. That can't be changed now, sadly, and he's unlikely to be the last of his kind. So as he sits in St. Alban's prison, where he so rightly belongs, we'll have to close that chapter and remember instead the truly innocent victims. Monty Fico Virginia Heisman Mersha Parpenfus, Georgina Zweni, Wane Wilkin, Henry Bakers, Katrina Clarson, and the two unidentified children. You are remembered. Thank you for listening to episode 45, The Crimes of Stuart Wilkin. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the app you're using to listen right now. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. I'll be back next Friday with a very special surprise for you. Until then, as always, thank you for your support and I'll chat to you soon. (music) 